It's a battle to save California's pristine coastline from devastation. Just north of Santa Barbara, the Alisol fire burns out of control, shutting down a section of the famed Pacific Coast Highway. Its breathtaking views now marred by smoke. Not only is this area prone to significant fires that have had significant damage in the past, but it's also a beautiful area. The fire doubling in size overnight, forcing evacuations from the forest to the sea. Firefighters now defending the famed Reagan Ranch, once known as the West Coast White House. You can see those flames climbing up that hillside just feet away from this highway. Fire officials say those dry fuels combined with the northerly winds are the reason why this highway will be closed for the foreseeable future. 7,000 acres scorched, 0% contained, threatening up to 120 structures. The toll adding to the state's staggering fire season. Almost 2 million acres burned so far. And do you tie this to climate change? You know, some people uh, would. We are seeing our fires burn differently. We're seeing them burn hotter and faster. They're more dangerous. Rancher Patrick Brown's family has owned this land for more than 80 years. He evacuated last night. Are you scared? Yeah. Tonight, fear, apprehension, and an all out effort to save one of the most beautiful stretches on earth. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Santa Barbara County. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app. fire on all sides all around us. The Labor Day weekend taking a terrifying turn for over 200 people in California's Sierra National Forest as flames, hot embers and thick smoke from the Creek Fire quickly surrounded and trapped campers at Mammoth Pool Reservoir. You can see smoke but they said it was like 22 miles away and uh, it was very fast and it was moving. literally like oh my god there's fire right there just keep going go, 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 go. juliana park and her friends who were hiking in the area were some of the last to make it out by car the fire looks like it's gonna just grab the car and we could feel the heat just throughout the vehicle by saturday night the fire had devoured over thirty-six thousand acres blocking the only way out of the campground the race to save lives forced to go airborne. I believe there's probably other people that are sheltered in the meadow, unknown at this time of uh, how many may still exist out there. In the middle of the night, first responders rushing trapped campers onto military helicopters to reach safety. As soon as we were in the helicopter, we flew over the fires and you couldn't see anything but pitch black and fire. That's all we could see. We saw firsthand why those evacuations were so critical. The smoke and haze has turned day to night as firefighters face yet another challenge on the front line. Many of the injuries are lacerations, broken bones and, and those kind of things and, and the kind of injuries you'd see when somebody's attempting to flee the fire. As ambulances rush to treat the injured, families and their young children grateful they survived. I'm glad to be alive. But across the state, the danger is still very real as flames fueled by triple digit temperatures threaten to destroy anything in its path. Outside of Fresno here, the Creek Fire is still burning totally out of control across California. More than 20 wildfires are burning across the region. And we should mention one outside of Los Angeles was started by a smoke grenade at a gender reveal party. Steve does not look good there and it does not look good for the near term in California. How are firefighters keeping up and are, and are residents prepared to move if they need to? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's these blast furnace like conditions, especially over the weekend, Katie. I mean, I think you said it 120 degrees. That's in L.A. County, Woodland. Uh, so you have this this extreme heat mixed with the fact that there's dry vegetation everywhere, mixed with the fact that we're still in red flag winds in a lot of places across California. There are more than two dozen fires, major fires that are burning spread out across California with over 14,000 firefighters on the front lines. That is happening right now. Two million acres have burned 
in California alone just this year. You're from California. You know how rare that is because we aren't really even in the heavy part of the season, which comes in October and November. If you're still on me, I want to show you this like moon-like landscape. Way off in the distance, you can still see firefighters, even as all this fuel is already burned, trying to put protection on some of these homes because of the smoldering may kick up as the day progresses. The winds pick up. That's when you have those firestorms that kick up once again. There is extreme still extreme fire danger, not only here in Southern California, but Central California and in the areas in between. This fire now 8,600 acres, 21,000 people evacuated from their homes. It's about 7% contained. This fire, as far as fire officials are now confirming, was started by a gender reveal gone wrong. It was apparently a photo op in a park that is very nearby to where I'm standing. They had some sort of smoke incendiary, uh, almost like a grenade that went off and exploded and caused this fire. Now 8,000 plus acres that have scorched the landscape. Those people are in touch with investigators. Investigators say they are cooperating, but they could still face an extremely heavy fine, if not some sort of criminal charges, based upon what the fire does Jeez. now. And this fire is continuing to spread, as is several of those fires across California. As we continue to monitor this, with the heat still keeping up, it has cooled off a little bit going on to the week, but it is still very hot, still very dry. And as the day moves on, it's still very windy. It is a lot for firefighters to take on, especially with how spread out all these fires are across the state of California. Katie, it is a dangerous situation. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos. Breaking news tonight, battling the wildfires. A shift in weather out west gives firefighters new hope as multiple fires spread, whole towns burned to the ground, dozens dead, more feared gone. And we're preparing for a mass fatality incident. In Oregon, two massive fires may merge into one, the desperate race to get out. A dangerous tropical storm drenches Florida, nearly a foot of rain. It's now plowing towards Louisiana on track to hit as a hurricane. New Hope, one of the world's most promising vaccine trials, restarts just days after it was suddenly halted. As political appointees are accused of trying to alter CDC reports to benefit President Trump. Police shut down a crowded dance party in lower Manhattan over COVID fears. And in Ohio, police bust this college gathering where one student admits he's positive for COVID. And the ultimate pet carrier. The man who rescued more than 16,000 cats and dogs on a wing and a prayer. This is NBC Nightly News with Jose diaz Bellart. Good evening. We begin with breaking news. The desperate rush is on to escape fast-moving, deadly wildfires out west. So far, millions of acres scorched with no end in sight. And the worst of it in Oregon, Washington, and California. President Trump today announcing plans to visit fire ravaged California on Monday. The dark, ashy smoke from it all affecting residents thousands of miles away. Our teams are in Northern California covering it all. And we begin with Aaron McLaughlin near the fire lines in Berry Creek. Tonight, West Coast fires burning out of control, but with cooler temperatures and lighter winds, a window of opportunity for firefighters to gain the upper hand and for residents to get out. The resort town of Detroit, Oregon, completely devastated. A fire truck torched, entire neighborhoods wiped out, business after business destroyed. Oh my God. 10% of Oregon State, more than half a million in evacuation zones. Traffic for miles. With dozens missing, it's unclear how many are dead. The state bracing for the worst. And thousands of structures have been lost. And we're preparing for a mass fatality incident. In California, Ziggy Rojor's mom, SV, is missing. My heart wants to cling to, you know, a hopeful, po hopeful possibility. But, you know, the reality is that my mom most likely didn't make it off the mountain. His aunt and uncle confirmed dead casualties of the North Complex fire. Rojour says he last spoke to all three Tuesday night. They weren't ready to face the largest, fastest fire to ever go through California. If you can get out, get out. In California, at least 19 dead, more than 3 million acres ablaze. 26 times the acreage at the same point last year. 
Fire Chief John Messina tells me this has become California's new normal. We have lost over 20,000 structures and 95 people have been killed in the last 20 months in this county by wildfire. It doesn't matter where you're at, that's hard to recover from. Less than an hour away, the town of Paradise, the site of the deadliest fire in state history. Two years later, now wary of the fire on their doorstep. You could smell the smoke. It triggered people back to when we had our campfire. And Aaron joins us now from Berry Creek, California. Aaron, what are you hearing from fire officials tonight? Jose, as you can see behind me, this local school's been completely leveled, though fire officials say they are making progress. Meanwhile, in Oregon, a concern, two massive fires merging into one. Jose? Aaron McLaughlin in Berry Creek, California. Thank you. The images from near those western wildfires are haunting. The smoke and ash so thick. Day looks like night in some places, and that air carries major health risks that could impact communities thousands of miles away. Scott Cohn reports. As wildfires sweep the west, I feel like I'm in an apocalypse. Hazardous air conditions stretch far beyond the flames. The smoke is terrible. Making air quality in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles some of the world's worst. The smoke spreading as far as Ohio and Hawaii earlier this week. In Portland, volunteers are distributing masks to wear outside. In Seattle, they're setting up shelters. And Washington state officials advising residents in affected areas to stay indoors, close windows, avoid physical exertion outdoors. In California, the governor says the air is even worse than it looks. The air we're breathing right now is equivalent to smoking 20 packs of cigarettes. Uh, it is profound and consequential. The health impacts strokes, heart attacks. Uh, respiratory issues. And experts are warning that breathing the smoke pollution could make the pandemic worse. When we inhale a lot of smoke or other uh, components, other chemicals that irritate the uh, lungs, the body and the lungs start to lose some of their defenses. So we do become more susceptible to viruses like COVID. It's not making me cough or anything, uh, but uh, it is giving me a uh, black phlegm in the morning that I'm coughing up. The smoke affecting even the healthy, but some are even more vulnerable. The people I'm very concerned about is uh, patients with chronic lung disease like asthma, like COPD, uh, patients with heart disease or diabetes, and small children as well. As the struggle to contain the fires continues, no breathing easy for a region in danger. Scott, any idea when the air quality will improve? Well, Jose, forecasters are saying that we could get a break uh, with change in the weather pattern over the next couple of days, but that's a double-edged sword because one of the things that's needed to clear out the smoke is more wind, but in terms of fighting these fires, that is the last thing they need. Scott Cohn in Northern California, thank you. The Gulf Coast is bracing for a possible hurricane. It's a tropical storm now bringing strong winds and an astonishing 11 inches of rain to the Florida Keys today. A flood watch has been issued in other parts of the state. NBC meteorologist Dylan Dreyer is tracking the storm for us tonight. Dylan. Good evening, Jose. Yes, the rain has been heavy all day long across southern Florida, especially across the Keys. Tropical Storm Sally has winds up to 40 miles per hour, and it's going to spend most of Sunday in the Gulf of Mexico, which is very warm and will likely give this storm enough strength to perhaps be a Category 1 hurricane on Monday before making landfall on Tuesday. As of right now, the track takes it to the east of New Orleans. It's likely we'll see a widespread five inches of rain with as much as eight inches. Early estimates right now. Now, but this is just one of six storms we are keeping an eye on. Obviously, though, Jose, mostly focused on this one as landfall is imminent on Tuesday. Dylan Dreyer, thank you so much. We turn now to breaking news on the COVID crisis. A vaccine trial shut down earlier this week over safety concerns is now restarting. Kathy Park reports. Tonight in the UK, phase three clinical trials for AstraZeneca's coronavirus vaccine are back on after hitting the brakes earlier this week when a participant got sick. How often do these trials start and stop? 
This is very common to happen in clinical trials for drugs, for vaccines, but typically we don't hear about them because there's not much attention paid to those trials. In a statement, the company said in part on September 6, the standard review process triggered a voluntary pause to allow review of safety data, adding trials in the UK are safe to resume. Around 18,000 people have received the vaccine that's being developed in partnership with the University of Oxford. The team is considered one of the front runners in the race for a COVID-19 vaccine. This does slow them down a bit, and I think we're going to see more and more of that as time goes on. But what it does show is, number one, that the safety protocols are being looked at very carefully. Back in the U.S., growing concerns over COVID clusters, especially on college campuses. In Ohio, police cited several people at a house near Miami University during the Labor Day weekend. Body camera footage captured a stunning exchange between an officer and a student. Where there's an input on the computer that you tested positive for COVID? Yes. When was this? This was a week ago. Are you supposed to be quarantining? Yeah, that's why I'm at my house. Do you have other people here and you're positive for COVID? I don't care. And for the second time in one week, hundreds packed a New York City park a party with few masks and little to no social distancing. Everyone's having so much fun. Like this is not like this is harmless. Honestly, it's harmless. I love it and I'm so happy I'm here. Oh, and Kathy, just how bad are the outbreaks on college campuses? Jose, this continues to be an ongoing problem. According to the New York Times, at least 88,000 cases have been reported on college campuses since the start of the pandemic, with at least 150 colleges reporting 100 cases each. Jose? Kathy Park in New York City. Thank you. President Trump is in Nevada tonight holding a large rally there despite local limits on crowd size. And now there's a new report about efforts to water down CDC reports about the virus. Kelly O'Donnell has laid details. Taking off for a Western swing, three states over three days, where the campaign and national crises meet. The 45th president's second term. Can I keep America great? Tonight's rally location near Carson City, Nevada, is a backup option. After several sites canceled or refused to hold the Trump events, concerned about violating state restrictions that limit gatherings to 50 adding to the administration's conflicts over COVID rules and public messaging. Politico reports that HHS communications officials, some without medical training, demanded early access and revisions to CDC reports on COVID in an effort to match the president's public optimism. We're rounding the turn. You see what's happening. In emails obtained by Politico, the communication aides requested some reports be modified because they believed they overstated the risk of COVID in children. They also forced a delay of a report that showed the risks of hydroxychloroquine, a treatment promoted by the president, outweighed the benefits. And they tried to restrict other health officials like Dr. Anthony Fauci from speaking out. No one is ever going to pressure me or muzzle me to say anything publicly. So whoever that person was that wrote that memo, it was the waste, it was a waste of an email. Kelly, if the Nevada rule is only 50 people for a gathering, is tonight's rally expected to keep to that? No, they'll disregard it completely. About a thousand people are expected and they will provide masks, but they won't enforce people actually wearing them. And Jose, tomorrow's event, a rally in Las Vegas, is scheduled to be held indoors, something that health officials have long said can increase the spread of the virus. Jose? Kelly O'Donnell in Carson City, thank you. Negotiations are underway overseas as two bitter enemies try to broker a peace deal that could end decades of war. Matt Bradley reports. This historic meeting between the Afghan government I am very proud and Taliban could be the beginning of the end for the longest uh, war in U.S. history. Afghans have at long last chosen to sit together and chart a new course for your country. This is a moment that we must dare to hope. The U.S. made its own peace deal with the Taliban in February. But with so many Afghans killed, there's no love lost between these two sides. I spoke with a Taliban representative in Doha two years ago. It sounds to me like once the U.S. withdraws its troops that you will seek to topple the Afghan government as it currently is in, in Kabul. That's accusation. We just want two main things. One is 
uh, end up occupation in an Islamic government in Afghanistan that's participated by al Afghans. And if these talks don't achieve the Taliban's goals, they vowed to keep fighting as long as they have to. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Still ahead, the surprising connection between changes in your signature and how it could impact getting your ballot counted. We're back now with our Vote Watch series and the big difference your signature can make when it comes to elections. Katie Beck explains. Stephanie Fusco mailed in her ballot for Pennsylvania's primary election, signed and on time. But a week after votes had been tallied, I received an email saying that um, your ballot has been canceled. Election officials determined that Fusco's ballot signature didn't match the one they had on file. Her vote thrown out, though her signature was authentic. I was really upset and I was very angry. You can't expect somebody to have the same signature from eight years ago. In the 2020 primaries, more than 550,000 ballots were rejected in 30 states. Due to missing signatures, missed deadlines, or signatures that could not be verified. I put a loop on the T-bar, you didn't. Handwriting expert Richard Orsini trains election workers to detect forged ballots. Orsini says no two signatures are identical and vary over time. Hand size and age and illness, medication, the writing position they were in. Were they depressed? Were, all those kind of factors come into play. Look at these actual signatures from former President Richard Nixon over a six year period. It does not look like the same person. Exactly, but yet all. it is, it's the same signature. Orsini says a mail-in voter's best defense against a possible mistake is to make sure the signature kept by the elections office is as current as possible. If I've got one written at least within the same year, within six months or so, that's going to be a much better indicator. While cases of disqualified ballots remain relatively low, data shows they do happen more often to some groups than others, specifically black, Latino and Asian voters. We had um, a lot of problems during the primaries. We saw incredibly long lines, especially in communities of color and in urban centers. Any Rambo? Election expert Wendy Weiser says November will be a challenge, but the process is improving and voters should trust it. People should not be wary. That said, we should be holding our system accountable and accountable to our ideals. Every vote fair and counted. Katie Beck, NBC News. When we come back, dog's best friend, the pilot who saved the lives of thousands of dogs. There's good news tonight about second chances and the pilot who turned his own personal tragedy into a mission, finding loving new homes for thousands of cats and dogs. You have you a load of barkers today, Peter. For Peter Rourke, flying is all in a day's work. Good morning, everybody. Peter, the pilot here. But for his passengers... We got an aircraft full of dogs and cats today. This trip will change their lives. His mission, fly at-risk animals from overcrowded shelters to adoption centers across the West and into the loving arms of new owners. I can carry four times as many animals and get them there three times as fast as they could on the ground. Transporting this precious cargo is a passion for the retired surgeon and accomplished aviator. He started the nonprofit Dog Is My Co-Pilot eight years ago as a way to heal after the sudden death of his wife, Meg. After I took the, the months off regrouping and, and working through my grief, I found a new purpose. A dog lover with three of his own, Rourke and other volunteer pilots now fly hundreds of dogs and cats a week to second chance shelters. In all, saving more than 16,000. This is number 16,000. And I can't believe what a sweetheart she is. On this trip, more than 80 animals to Paul's shelter near Seattle. There's a large demand for adopting animal companions, especially now during the pandemic. Uh, the average stay is about five to seven days. Each getting a health check, new bed, and lots of love. Without Dog as my co-pilot, these animals certainly wouldn't have a chance. A chance at a new life with families like the Lozars in Montana. She is just a sweet, sweet dog. They adopted Charlotte after she was one of Peter's passengers. Now she's right at home with her forever family. We snuggle on some nights and then on other nights she just sleeps on a blanket at the end of my bed. She snores. 
pretty heavily. <laughs> Smiles and comfort thanks to an angel with wings. When they receive the dogs, uh, I know they're going to be safe. Uh, I know they're going to have a great life. I've been at it over eight years now and I'm looking forward to the next eight and we're on a roll. Peter says even if you can't permanently adopt a dog or cat, fostering a rescue is a great option. Before we go, I'd like to invite you to check out my new digital series, Today's American Dream. We talk to leaders and visionaries about their unique American journeys. In our first episode, one of the world's biggest YouTube stars, Lele Pons, and how she triumphs over adversity. You can view it at NBCNews.com slash Nightly Films or as a podcast in the Nightly News feed wherever you get your podcasts. That's NBC Nightly News for this Saturday. I'm Jose diaz Bolart. Thank you for the privilege of your time. And good night. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching. Yeah, there's a road that leads right here, boss. Overnight, firefighters racing against a raging wall of flames. I want everybody out of that town in five minutes. Locked in a desperate scramble to save lives while struggling to protect their own. You need to get moving now. The fire's coming over you. The so-called East Troublesome Fire exploding, at times erupting at a rate of 6,000 acres an hour. That's nearly 80 football fields per minute. The winds were strong. The fire behavior was strong. It was a challenging day. Shutting down Rocky Mountain National Park, forcing thousands to flee. It's getting worse. Homeowner Carrie Ann Fain told to evacuate as the flames came rushing in. It's bad. It's really bad. Documenting the harrowing escape out of town. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Cameron Peak Fire, the largest in state history, burned an estimated 50 structures since Monday. Tonight, the two fires only 10 miles apart. With dry conditions and red flag winds, authorities worried they could combine into a monstrous mega fire. I know it's unfortunate that we have wildfires, but I know that people will come back and that people will build. A wildfire crisis, unlike anything residents in the Rocky Mountain state have ever seen. Steve Patterson, NBC News. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching. Overnight, flames from the Deadly Creek Fire raging again in California. And again, the blaze forcing rescue teams into action to save dozens of people trapped in the Sierra National Forest, where over 100,000 acres have now been torched over the last four days. National Guard chopper pilots using night vision to pluck trapped campers from the inferno. It comes after more than 200 similar rescues over the weekend. The fire also sparking last minute evacuations. Residents in its path forced to drive through a tunnel of fire. It felt like a movie. It was a living nightmare. Go, 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 go. Gabriela Favela made this heart stopping escape from the flames. Park rangers realized she only had minutes to get to safety. She told us in my 21 years of being a ranger, I've never seen the fires this bad. We are completely surrounded by fires. And she said, you guys need to leave now. In the small town of Big Creek, a race to save essential structures. Crews trying to stop the blaze from reaching dangerous electrical equipment. But it was too late for so many who call this home. The fire spread fast. Uh, the winds were strong. Christina Vasquez saw this photo of the devastating aftermath in her neighborhood, not long after she evacuated. To know that our home is not just a memory. That's the only place where our own lives is in our heads now. Um, it's all rubble. It's all it's all burnt now. We were in the middle of the firefight. The conditions on the front lines here are intense. You can see crews trying to do everything they can not to save this home, but others nearby. Satellite images show the creek fire exploding in just hours. The smoke visible from space, the poor air quality impacting millions. The Golden State red hot. Dozens of fires torching a record 2 million acres. 
including this blaze near San Bernardino, ignited by a gender reveal party. It's not the first time one has gone wrong. This 2017 reveal in Arizona cost $8 million in damage. Start packing up! This morning, flames moving faster than crews. The fear even more will be lost. At this hour, rescue teams say dozens of people still need to be pulled out of the fire zone. So the situation here on the ground remains incredibly fluid and the high fire danger remains all across this region. In fact, one local power company is cutting power lines to some homes because of the fire threat is so high. Overnight, the colossal East Troublesome Fire, growing to over 170,000 acres, now the second largest fire in Colorado history. The flames forcing thousands to flee in panic, clogging county roads under blood red skies. Your friends' homes are on fire and you're watching it with your eyes. Evacuee Roddy Kimball grabbed what she could before racing away. That's probably the last time we would see our home. Kate Brown watched her house burn from her doorbell camera. It was horrific, absolutely horrific to watch. This was really the worst of the worst of the worst because what happened is it came in so quick. Sheriff Brett Schrotland says the damage is vast and they're not out of the woods yet. Big weather system coming in. What's the biggest challenge with that? The wind fire here and fire here, and we want to make sure that um, we keep everybody safe as that wind front comes through. Tonight, as the firefight continues in neighborhoods ravaged by flames, evacuees are left only with the hope they have a home to return to. Lester, the two largest wildfires in Colorado history are burning dangerously close, just miles apart. Thankfully, cooler temperatures are helping on both fronts, but with powerful winds moving in, that could change in a heartbeat. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching. Fire emergencies threatening thousands in Colorado tonight. In Boulder County, the Calwood fire broke out Saturday. This is actually the biggest wildfire in Boulder County history. Fueled by high winds and dry conditions, it burned more than 8,000 acres in less than 24 hours, forcing the entire community of Jamestown to evacuate. I feel like I want to cry, just really emotional. This time lapse shows a thick plume of smoke growing on the horizon, consuming the sky and visible for miles. You just don't know what's going to happen. To the north, crews are gaining ground fighting the Cameron Peak fire burning since mid-August. It's already scorched more than 200,000 acres, now the biggest wildfire in Colorado's history. Fire season usually ends in the fall, but extreme weather is fueling the destruction, raising the risks for residents and those on the front lines. Kathy Park, NBC News. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching. Whipped by catastrophic winds for a second day, the wildfires in Southern California sound like a jet engine as they explode across Orange County. As massive walls of fire threaten homes, nearly 90,000 people were forced to suddenly flee flames. This is a mandatory evacuation zone. I thought the world was ending. Tonight, authorities are investigating if electrical equipment may have sparked the fire. It's not the power inside of these wildfires, but the wind that's causing all of this damage and so much destruction. Facing some of the most dangerous conditions this year, two young firefighters were critically injured. Tonight across the state, 23 million are facing red flag warnings. The winds were, I mean, they were whipping. So I can only imagine what it was doing to fan the fire. There is some good news. Those erratic and powerful Santa Ana winds here in Southern California are finally starting to ease up. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. 
Thanks for watching. When you think of Siberia, you likely don't think about wildfires. After all, Siberia is one of the coldest places on the planet during the winter time. But in summer, temperatures can be rather moderate. But our changing world has made their summers increasingly hotter. And now officials in the region are battling an unprecedented crisis that has implications for all of us. ABC's Patrick Reville traveled to Siberia to see the fight against the wildfires firsthand. What can be one of the coldest places on Earth is on fire. Gigantic infernos burning across Siberia on an unprecedented scale, a climate catastrophe. The wildfires burning in Russia now are bigger than all the fires raging across the globe combined, bigger than those in the US, Canada, Turkey and Greece put together. This the view as passengers fly into Yakutia, a region 3,000 miles from Moscow. But in Siberia, before you can fight wildfires, first you have to get to them. So we're driving out now, hopefully to try and reach one of the fire teams that are working near the village. We've got to drive over this dirt road. See, it's not really a road. We are in the Tiger, and it's not easy going. So the bumper has just been torn off the car on this track. The car that went before us got completely stuck. So hopefully that isn't going to happen to us. Traveling in Siberia, you know. Swarms of insects mean we need these protective suits. Made it through that one. It's about six kilometers more to go. We have come to Yakutia because it's one of the front lines of climate change. Much of the region is in the Arctic, and in winter, it's one of the coldest inhabited places on Earth. But summers are warm, and this year is seeing an extreme heat wave and historic drought. One of the hottest, driest summers on record. 10 times more fires are burning than usual. Smoke from them has reached Alaska, and for the first time in history, the North Pole. So this is where we were trying to get to, the camp where the guys are basically going out and trying to fight the fires. Say they don't have enough equipment, they have a tractor over there that's broken down because it doesn't have enough oil. This group from Russia's forestry fire service, known as Aviales Akhrana, have been here for nearly a month. It is a vastly unequal fight. They say they are short of men and equipment. <laughs> Afanasi is one of hundreds of local residents who volunteered to fight the fires because of the shortage of manpower. He's saying if the wind gets up, that will already start to spread all over the trees here. Within 10, 15 minutes, it could be everywhere, really. The team's main tools are digging trenches and controlled burns like this. But there is only so much they can do. When the wind gets up, the fire spreads rapidly. Here, another group forced to retreat. And this is what happens when the fires get past the teams. The flames engulfing this village. Over 30 buildings destroyed. Only burnt out cars and smoldering rubble left. The record drought fueling the fires has been linked by scientists to climate change. And the change in Yakutia's climate is already visible. Parts of Siberia are warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. The smog is really bad this morning. You can really feel it in your eyes and in your throat. People have spent nearly a month struggling in the dirty air. Uh, 
All this smoke is a problem far beyond Russia. The fires are releasing record quantities of carbon dioxide. This year, already more than Britain's entire annual CO2 emissions, based on an estimate by a European Union agency. You really feel the scale of the fire here. This whole area burned only about three weeks ago. You see, just as far as you can look, it's all blackened and burnt. With increased temperatures now believed to be inevitable, Yakutia's massive fires are likely to only get worse. Scientists say another sign of how fast and how drastically the planet's climate is changing. Patrick Revel, ABC News, Yakutia, Russia. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching. This fire broke out south of Boulder just after 11 this morning. Since then, nearly 600 homes have been burned making it Colorado's most destructive wildfire in just a matter of hours. Authorities say both fires were caused by power lines knocked down by strong, very powerful winds. And the situation really escalated so quickly, catching Coloradans off guard as they were just going about their days. This video shared on Twitter shows shoppers evacuated from the Costco in Superior. And many appear to be just uh, surprised by just how serious the situation is when they get outside. As the fire continues to burn, tens of thousands of Coloradans are under evacuation orders. The areas you see in red on this map, those are areas where evacuation orders are in place. The areas in yellow are under evacuation warnings. Now, several evacuation sites, centers are set up tonight. Here's a list provided by the governor's office. In Lafayette, you have the YMCA of Northern Colorado on Dagny Way. In Niwot, the Rocky Mountain Christian Church on Niwot Road. In Boulder, the North Boulder Rec Center on Broadway. In Longmont, the Longmont Senior Center. However, that location is not for overnight shelters. For animals that need to be evacuated, they can be brought to the Jefferson County Fairgrounds. All right, let's get to tonight's team coverage, and there is a lot of it. We have our crews all across Boulder County right now. We'll check in with everyone here in a second, but we want to get right out to Denver 7's Russell Haythorn. Russell, your Coal Creek Golf Course there in, in Louisville, that's where you are, uh, and you've seen some, some awful, awful flames there all day long. It started with an ominous cloud of smoke in Boulder County, cars turning around on US 36 to escape the fast moving wildfire. It quickly grew out of control. It got real smoky and it, it just kept increasing. Let's go back up. Moving so fast, it caught even us off guard and several people in nearby businesses and hotels. We're near, we're near here. The fire is not far. Then mass evacuations in suburban Denver. <laughs> Officers going door to door in Superior, a natural disaster unlike anything anyone in Colorado has ever seen. Superior and Louisville residents racing home from work to save their pets and keepsakes. We saw your reports on TV from, from McCaslin and uh, Cherry in the Dillon area right by the, the movie theater. And it, you were describing like Armageddon. So it was like, okay, I'm definitely going home and we're definitely packing and getting out. It's frustrating because, you know, people want to go to save their pets or check on her property, but you yeah. can't let anybody go in there. Then, evidence of catastrophic damages and widespread destruction. Sadly, apartment complexes completely engulfed, houses on fire. I've seen people's homes, family lives go up, you know, and these high winds really are making it uncontrollable. The governor and other leaders saying hundreds of homes lost in Colorado. Russell Haythorn for us tonight. Thanks, Russ. Unbelievable images. Let's check in now with Denver 7's Sloan Dickey, who's live south of the Rocky Springs neighborhood or Rock Springs neighborhood. That's just south of Superior. Sloan, uh, what are you seeing? Yeah, well, we're starting to get a look at exactly how much damage and maybe not the scale of the damage, but the intimate details of 
how much damage is being done to these homes. I just want to walk you through the scene right now. We have several vehicles right now uh, parked out, of, out here. They're firefighting vehicles just trying to uh, take care of those last flames that have popped up. Um, and right across the street, you can see these firefighters are putting out some flames. It's kind of hard to see, but this used to be a home. Now it is reduced to ashes. If you just follow me, uh, I want to show you the damage that's been done to some of these homes. Uh, now it might just look like one home, but this is a family's home that 12 hours ago was standing. Uh, this has now been reduced to rubble and just the intensity of the fire actually burned the paint and the tires off of this car that you can see right here. Um, this just repeats itself house after house after house, uh, probably for about 20 to 30 homes on El Dorado Road. Uh, and we're right now on El Dorado and Imperial in the Rock Springs neighborhood. Uh, you can see behind me, there's still some efforts of firefighters. They're trying to just kind of keep the houses to the north side of El Dorado Road, uh, damp, keep them, keep them away from the flames. Uh, they've done a heroic job. At one point, we saw maybe 15 to 20 uh, fire engines lined up on El Dorado Road, just making sure that the flames didn't jump from the south side to the north side. But on that north side where the flames really took off and during that windy moment, they, they, just, they just jumped the house to house to house and we were actually on the other side. Um, this is a garage that you're looking at right now. Two cars completely reduced to rubble. On the other side, it looks like a cliff. That's actually where the home used to be. Um, we're just witnessing this damage right now. Yet another home, hundreds just like this in a matter of hours. So uh, we're witnessing right now the first uh, glimpses of what we're going to see a lot more of tomorrow, tomorrow unfortunately. Uh, and then on, in, this, in this house right here, you can see just the winds were so strong that this lamppost was knocked over. We saw several different efforts of firefighting, uh, including uh, using ladders, using fire engines, the large ones, some of the smaller ones that are used for wildland firefighting. And we spoke with a firefighter who actually said that they had a different strategy here was just to contain the fire to this row of houses. They couldn't do anything to stop the flames here, but they wanted to make sure that it didn't jump the road. It looks like they were largely successful in that effort. Um, but right now across the street from these flames, uh, this fire engine is actually packing up right now. Um, but it was an intense day for firefighters. Uh, for a while, as the winds were picking up to 100 miles an hour here, they had to just watch and wait until these winds died down and see what they could save after the winds died down. Uh, it was certainly a heroic effort uh, from the firefighters out here. We're just now comprehending the damage. Uh, taking a look at your live shot. Thank you, Sloan. And the fire has gotten very close to health care facilities. A Vista Adventist Hospital in Louisville was fully evacuated this afternoon as the fire burned homes nearby. Patients were transferred to other hospitals. Denver 7's Bayon Wang has also been close to these fires all afternoon and evening. Bayon joins us now live from Louisville. You're near the Summit at Flatirons Apartments overlooking the Rock Springs subdivision. Uh, and you have some accounts from the people who had to evacuate there. Yeah, we spoke to a lot of them with a lot of different accounts, a lot of them incredibly tense as those fires from Superior blew east towards Broomfield, towards their apartment complex. They were evacuated, incredibly scared. We're actually back up here off of the 128 and McClaston Boulevard uh, looking over Superior. And I want to step out of the way because for a uh, large part of the night. This is where we were with the broad scope of everything. We heard from Sloan, we heard from Russell, and they were in the midst of the discussion there. Um, we, we could go ahead and just pull up some shots from earlier. Uh, you know, as Sloan and Russell were down there, uh, you know, they were up and close to where the houses were burning. From our vantage point up here, uh, okay, uh, from, from our vantage point from up here, um, it was a lot more of an inferno looking type of scene. We're still seeing flames 
in the distance. A lot of glows in different parts of Superior. Panning over to the right, there was a lot of flames that were moving towards the Broomfield area. Um, since the gusts have calmed down, we ha ha have seen a lot of the fires either die down or fire crews finally able to get over to them with better visibility, less smoke to put out those spot fires that started uh, after those gusts went down. Now, as you guys have been mentioning, uh, the entire city of Superior was evacuated. That's 13,000 people. And overall, tens of thousands of people have been evacuated. All of Louisville was also evacuated. Parts of Broomfield, parts of Westminster, and, and, and Arvada was even put, some parts of Arvada was put on some pre-evacuations. But those have since been lifted. Those pre-evacuation orders in parts of Arvada have been lifted. Um, and, and, you know, we, we also thought it was important to pay a visit to some of these evacuation centers to kind of see you know who was going there and what their situation was and here's what they told us it's minute to minute dude I'm, I'm trying to keep it together to be honest um and not doing the best job of it i mean seeing an entire 2,000, 3,000 square foot home just on fire that close to you yeah i, I don't want anybody to have to deal with that terrifying like on the way on the, on the way in it was just smoke like the harper lake area looked like it was all going up you could see heavy black nasty construction material smoke And just, you know, devastating hearing some of their accounts and, and really the people that we've been meeting out here. Now, in the far distance over there, that's northwest of Superior. Remember, two hours ago, we said, hey, look, we see a little spot fire in the corner um, uh, several miles away from Superior. That's towards Boulder County. And that flame those flames you're seeing over there was uh, was just a little hot spot was just a little glow um and with you know the winds changing direction that has visibly grown a lot and, and that's the unpredictable here w what's going to happen next obviously we are not expecting those gusts to come back um but but you never know we we have had some uh you know pop up here and there not as strong as before but um enough to pick up an ember and take it from point a to point b and and possibly light stuff on fire we have been seeing that here for the last hour um, as we you know we're in town in Broomfield however with fire crews having more resources available with the gusts clearing up um, they've been able to get to a lot of them quickly and, and save a lot of homes um, we, we mentioned those evacuation centers uh, at our latest report here I, I'm just getting this right now um, currently it's North Boulder Rec Center there's an evacuation center there Longmont Senior Center Rocky Mountain Christian Church, First Bank Center, and YMCA of Northern Colorado. And you can definitely find the directions uh, for those evacuation centers on our website, thedenverchannel.com. Right. Bye and Wang, thanks for your work tonight. Denver 7's Gary Brobe, also live in Boulder County. He joins us uh, live from Highway 128 in El Dorado in Broomfield. Gary? Yeah, we're just north of 128 over here. Uh, earlier in the day, the reason why we were over here to give you a little context, there were some mandatory evacuations for nearby apartment complexes south of 128. Uh, that was obviously precautionary. We don't believe, at least in this area, that it's jumped over. Uh, but we did talk to several people who franked, frantically were trying to get out there as fast as they could once they found out the news. But since that time, we have been in this area getting a bird's eye view down the valley of Broomfield from where we're, we're at. And really, this is a whole different look than what we saw several hours ago. This uh, several neighborhoods were were structures were just lit up on fire. Um, right now, though, we are really the only thing that, that we're seeing is a lot of first responder lights and a lot of smoke. Uh, further down, we were seeing a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, hot spots popping up as well, though. Uh, now that we're, we're showing you this, this is McCaslin in Washington uh, over in Louisville earlier uh, this evening. This was taken by photojournalist. Uh, Eric English, a longtime veteran here at Denver 7, uh, he tells me when I asked, was that one house or multiple, he said dozens and dozens and dozens of homes he saw engulfed in flames from the video you're looking at. It is truly hard to watch. And to give you an idea of where that's at, if you're familiar with Harper Lake, that development, what you're looking at is just south of Harper Lake just north of Louisville Police Department. Of course, we're hearing that it, uh, just around the area of the Louisville Rec Center, we are still trying to figure out uh, what's going on with that. But 
We mentioned McCasin in Washington. That was the video you just saw. As we take a look over here, this is directly west of where we're at uh, here in Broomfield, and that is some plumes in the, the very, very far back there, but that is directly west where we're at in Broomfield, right at McCaslin Boulevard. So it looks like that fire just went directly south, at least a part of it went directly south right there at McCaslin because we have seen that hotspot come and go uh, for about an hour now. It's looked much worse than that. Uh, but right now I do see a few flames kind of piercing through the ridge line. Uh, but everything else, as I mentioned, looking much, much better than uh, it did just an hour or two ago uh, where it looked like the fire was just kind of periodically just picking and choosing its, its, uh, its structures that it wanted to go after, but it really does now look like things are a lot more calm, a lot more uh, under control. Uh, of course, of course, we are, uh, you know, obviously monitoring the winds, and I will tell you, right now is the first time I'm actually feeling some winds starting to pick up in the last couple of hours, which is probably a good, uh, good thing, and the reason why they're able to get that under control. Uh, so we're going to send it back to you in the studio. All right, Gary Bro, thanks for your hard work as well all day long on this. Just. Just so much devastation and so much help that's going to be needed for those impacted. The Boulder County Community Foundation has set up a fund for people wanting to donate. And we have also set up a Denver 7 Gives to help those impacted by these fires. You can donate right now. Just go to our web page and click on December Wildfires to give. We're also going to be working to find a partner so we can get more Coloradans more help more quickly. Continuing our coverage, our breaking news coverage now of the devastating fires in Boulder County. All right, Governor Polis has declared a state of emergency for Boulder County, and this is what he had to say earlier this evening about the fires. We declared a state of emergency earlier today. I just found out that we've been approved for Fire Management Assistance Grant, FMAG. That's federal assistance. Uh, we're going to, of course, be starting damage assessments for public assistance and individual assistance. Many people, of course, also uh, have that alongside fire insurance, but there's no way to quantify in any financial way uh, the price of a loss of losing, you know, the chair that was handed down to you from your grandmother, of losing your childhood yearbooks, of losing your photos, of losing your computer files, uh, which hundreds of Colorado families have experienced today with no warning. Gusts of 100, 110 miles an hour can and have moved this fire down a football field in a matter of seconds. Very little time to get out, uh, very little time to even get the most important parts of your life. And yes, it'll be a difficult process for Colorado families who are direct affected to rebuild their lives. Also, Colorado Congressman Joe Neguse, one of the thousands of people evacuated in Boulder County today. And earlier this evening, we talked to him live on the air, and his immediate thoughts were with those families who have lost everything. To think of the many families tonight who have lost everything, lost all of their belongings, lost their homes, truly unprecedented to see this kind of uh, carnage uh, here in, in our suburban communities in Boulder uh, County. And uh, it is a, it's just a tough, tough day for our community certainly is. And late tonight, uh, Congressman Nagus announced that FEMA funds to fight this Marshall Fire will be here. He represents, uh, Nagus represents the uh, second congressional district that Boulder County community included. The authorization makes FEMA funding available to pay 75% of the state's eligible firefighting costs. Let's bring in Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson now. He has been essential to us today. Mike, this is unlike anything we have ever seen before. And it's much, much needed snow and cold is on the way. I've been in this business for 45 years, 30 of them along the front range. I've never seen anything like what we've witnessed today. Let me show you the current wind conditions. And it's been a difficult night because the winds drop off and then they come back. Now gusting to 44 miles per hour in Boulder, 45 up on Berthoud Pass. This is the peak wind gusts we had earlier today, 115 miles per hour at Rocky Flats, about the time the power lines went down and the fires began. Shortly thereafter, 103 miles per hour at White Ranch open space and throughout much of the early afternoon, 70 to 75 mile per hour winds, the Boulder, Niwot, Lyons area, 
and that just continued to fan the flames throughout the afternoon. Now, this is a time lapse taken from our Viero camera in Alt up by Fort Collins. Notice this little wave pattern in the smoke. This is a mountain wave, and what happens there is the winds coming off the mountains are amplified like waves crashing on a beach as they come down along the front range. And right where the fire started, the mouth of El Dorado Canyon is notoriously one of those windy spots along the front range as the canyon funnels those winds right into southeastern Boulder County. This is about 5 to 6 p.m., a high-resolution map of the wind vectors coming in from the west across northern Jeff Coast, southern Boulder County, and swirling into the fire area, as you can see in the pink color. As this fire was so big and hot, it created its own weather system, a firestorm swirling oxygen into that fire, carrying the smoke and the ash up to 20,000 feet into the atmosphere and then carrying it out across the eastern plains. This was a view of the fire taken from an airliner about maybe seven or 8,000 feet above ground, taking off from DIA. And you see the large area just before dusk covered in that fire. This is what the smoke plume looked like throughout much of the day. Now, in recent minutes, that smoke plume has really decreased in coverage. What we see off to the west here, that is actually snow falling in the mountains, and snow becomes the next key word in our weather equation because we do have winter weather advisories covering eastern Colorado for tomorrow and winter storm warnings up in the mountains. We are expecting up to a foot or two of snow to fall in the mountains and across the eastern plains with the winter weather advisory, about three to five inches of snow expected. So as this system comes in, it's late, it's going to help, but obviously far too late for all of those people who have catastrophically lost their homes. But we're going to see probably about six inches of snow fall tomorrow and tomorrow night in the area hit by the fire. Unfortunately, it also comes in with sharply colder weather. It will drop to the single digits by early Saturday morning. Mike, thank you very much for that. Let's check in now with Denver 7 Sloan Dickey, who is live south of the Rock Springs neighborhood. That's just south of Superior Sloan. What are you seeing? Yeah, and just one clarification. I said last hit it was Rock Springs. It's actually the Rock Creek neighborhood. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I clarify that. We're on Imperial Road right now and El Dorado, and I've just been thinking a lot about the victims of this, this fire who have lost everything, and I just want to get some of the stories that are already coming out from what I've seen, and just if you can just take a look right here. This used to be a garage right here. Um, and you can look out, it's a little bit dark right now. We've lost some of the light from the fire engines, but you can still see this was somebody's home. Uh, and this was the pillars that held up that home. Uh, and I just wanna take you over here to show you that this, this home that you just saw, um, something that ironically and tragically survived was a child swing. And we were just kind of moved by that because uh, this was obviously a family and there was a lot of joy in this home and it's, it is no more. And just one other thing I wanted to show you that we saw when we were walking through this neighborhood uh, now that these homes have burned down is several cars still in garages. Um, people just leaving with what they could. Um, and this seemed like a, a very uh, happy neighborhood. Uh, the other side of the street is still uh, is the houses are still standing. I've been getting some messages on social media asking specifically which homes um, were burned to the ground. And I'm going to be as specific as I can. Um, we're on Imperial and El Dorado Road. We've seen about 20 homes along the south side of the Rock Creek neighborhood um, have burned to the ground. Um, the firefighters have done a really great job to save as many homes as they can. We heard from the firefighter who said that they were trying to save as many homes as they could on the north side of El Dorado Road. Um, it seems as though they have been largely successful in that. I, I can't be specific. I don't know which homes were saved and which ones weren't, but it seems as though the ones on the south side of El Dorado Road, uh, unfortunately, many of them have not made it. Um, if you are on the north side, uh, the chances are your house uh, the chances that your house is still standing is, is much greater. But um, I really just want to get this across that these individual homes, we're going to be talking about hundreds of homes and thousands and thousands of people impacted. Uh, each one of those lives is important. Uh, and each one of those lives is our neighbors. And uh, a lot of people are hurting tonight and will be hurting 
tomorrow as well. Each one of those lives going to need help. Thank you, Sloan. And as we've been saying, tens of thousands of Coloradans have been forced from their homes tonight because of the fire. Denver 7 CB Cot live in Westminster tonight. You're at 112th and Sims. Uh, you have the latest on the evacuations. CB. Shannon, Jessica, that's right. It seems like information is changing every minute, but here's what we know in terms of the latest on evacuations. There was a pre-evacuation order for people in Arvada, but that was lifted earlier tonight. But another evacuation order went right into effect for another community here in Colorado just after 8.30 p.m. tonight, the Boulder Office of Emergency Management put a mandatory evacuation order in place for residents in this neighborhood behind me. Uh, this is the Meadowview area near 107th and Sim Street, as you said, Shannon, and this is one of the last uh, one of the latest evacuation orders that we learned about uh, for this area. Now, I want to transition over to evacuation centers for people who've had to leave their neighborhoods tonight. Um, some options for them to, to go to various places. So here are the shelters that we know of. We know of the YMCA of Northern Colorado. They are open tonight. Um, we also know the North Boulder Rec Center. They're open as well as the Rocky Mountain Christian Church. Also, another area that people can go to is the Longmont Senior Center. And then another location is the First Bank Center of Broomfield. Now, these are all evacuation centers for people who have not tested positive for COVID-19. For those residents who've had to leave their homes who have tested positive, they are being asked to go to the Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Boulder. That is located at 3485 Stanford Court. I wanna share that address one more time, 3485 Stanford Court. Now, for those who've had to leave their homes who may have animals or pets, they are being asked to go to they are being asked to bring their pets to the Boulder County Fairgrounds. That area is going to be serving as a large animal shelter. Um, and, you know, we know that they are having some capacity issues right now, but they are taking some pets. So residents, if you have a pet, you have animals, feel free to stop by there. Um, also, the Riverdale Riverdale Animal Shelter is, is assisting families with displaced pets, pets and large animals due to the fire evacuations in this region. So of course, information changing every minute it seems, but right now we know the latest evacuation order in place is happening here in Westminster at this neighborhood behind me, Meadowview Estates. Of course, we're gonna keep track of these evacuations and bring our viewers all the latest on air and online. Back to you all. CB, thank you. As the fire continues to burn, tens of thousands of Coloradans are under evacuation orders. The area you see in red on this map, those are where evacuation orders are currently in place. The areas in yellow are under evacuation warnings. And we are continuing to uh, monitor the situation. Uh, uh, this is the uh, Flatirons Crossing area uh, where homes are, are, are currently burning. And you can see the emergency lights from fire crews and emergency officials uh, going door to door and, and trying to protect as much property as possible. And this has been one of the incredible vantage points we've had uh, all evening long looking north here uh, to, to get a bigger scope on just how uh, many fires have burned within these uh, this Marshall fire. How many homes? How many neighborhoods? And and though conditions are improving, uh, so much damage already has been done. Uh, and it's it is such good news that the firefighters can actually fight some fires tonight. So for the lion's share of today, that just wasn't possible because of the the incredible incredible ferocious winds they had. So at least tonight they are able to. They are able to uh, to make some headway on some of these fires tonight. Let's go back out with uh, Denver 7 Sloan Dickey, who is in Rock Creek, and he just has a, a very devastating picture behind him of of just uh, the impact this has had on, on 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 that neighborhood. Sloan. Yeah, it's a devastating picture, but one thing that you mentioned, and I just want to reiterate, is the her her heroics of the firefighters who have been fighting these flames are actually just kind of moving out some of the of the hoses right now to save what they've used to save these homes and I just want to show you the house to my left or your left that house has been destroyed um, but the house to the right seems to mostly be be okay and that's because of the heroic efforts of these firefighters we've been here all day watching as they've dumped gallons thousands of gallons of water on these homes 
and they have uh, stood right next to the flames as they've been burning down homes. And it's been hundreds of firefighters. We've seen so many different counties, different jurisdictions of sheriff's departments, uh, different police departments kind of banding together to, to fight these flames and to keep the public safe. Um, and if there's any note that I want from this live shot to get through, it's that a lot of people put in a lot of effort uh, to save as many homes as possible. And we, we were, really had a privilege of getting to watch these heroic firefighters do their best work today. And I think a lot of those firefighters and a lot of those first responders are going to look back on this day uh, as a day where they really stepped up um, and saved a lot of lives. Many of those firefighters uh, saving homes while they don't know the status of their own home. Absolutely. Thank you, Sloan. Uh, the, now we know that this fire uh, possibly started because of down power lines because of high winds. Let's check back in with Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson, who is uh, tracking uh, some moisture in the forecast that could really, really, really make a difference. Mike. It will certainly help tomorrow. Today we had the hurricane force winds. We've had the extreme drought since the beginning of June and a very warm December with a dozen days that have been in the 60s or warmer. A catastrophic combination. And let's not lose the climate change connection. This is all related to what we're seeing from a warmer world due to the increase in temperature, due to the increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels, the fire triangle, the wind, the heat, and the dry conditions. It's pretty simple. If it gets hot, it gets dry. If it's dry, the fire danger is greater along the front range. We've certainly seen the catastrophic result of that today. Here's the good news. The snow coming in. It's going to be heavy in the mountains and a few inches expected on the plains. Not such great news. The bitter cold temperatures that follow for those who have lost so much. They're also going to have to deal with temperatures in the single digits to near zero degrees by Sunday morning. The snow will help, but the drought certainly is far from over. Mike, thank you uh, so much for all your work today. And I, I want to single out all of the reporters, uh, all of the photographers uh, who have, have worked tirelessly and very bravely in some crazy conditions mm -hmm. earlier this afternoon. And our crews are going to be uh, out all night long uh, surveying uh, what they can and, uh, and uh, figuring out just, just what has been lost. We know it is so, so much. We know that this is going to be a long night for all of those who are evacuated. Not much sleep going to be happening for those folks as they are anxiously awaiting news for their homes. Um, and, and we'll continue to give you updates online on the denverchannel.com and on social media throughout the evening as well. Um, and we want to thank, you know, all of the emergency officials and firefighters and, and those who are doing evacuations and the good work that they're doing uh, to get people to shelter and, and give them resources uh, throughout the night and, and who have worked so hard today just to let people know what is going on. All right, we'll be back on the air at 4.30 a.m. I'm so very sorry that we're having to go through this, but I so appreciate you turning to us in this time. Good night. how our climate driven conditions are altering the environment and are making these fires move faster and make them more complex and ultimately more dangerous than anything that we faced in the past. Uh, we're seeing very gusty winds and are seeing it combined with dry conditions and record drought, making this for a very, very dangerous and severe situation. Right now we are in a very dynamic and challenging firefight happening in concurrently and in multiple corners of Northern California from Siskiyou County uh, all the way down to uh, El Dorado County and even a new fire in, in uh, Upper Tulare County. Uh, to date, the governor has proclaimed 11 counties under states of emergencies and has secured fire management assistance grants for the counties of El Dorado, Lassen, Plumas, Siskiyou, Trinity, Nevada, and Placer uh, from the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency. Uh, these federal uh, fire management assistance grants are, uh, enable local, state, and tribal agencies involved in the response to uh, get funds that are necessary to ensure that they've got ongoing support for those fires and, and get reimbursed uh, for their firefighting costs. Still, even with all of that, the human impact of these fires is significant. Uh, there are currently roughly 31,000 Californians under evacuation of some sort. 
Uh, 500 individual, individuals are currently being housed in shelters, uh, and we're using every tool at our disposal to meet the needs of these folks and the challenge overall. Currently, there are over 10,000 personnel working on these fires from state, local, and federal agencies, uh, as, as well as uh, uh, 766 engines, 172 hand crews, 200. Unparalleled among states uh, is currently working hard, but is is stretched. Uh, we're, we've deployed uh, many many resources from that system, uh, including uh, uh, going out to uh, other states, and we were able to re get some some resources from Utah uh, to come in to support us. But but even at that, uh, there are fires, uh, major fires in the twelve western states, and so. Resources are really running thin throughout the Western United States, and so even getting EMAC a grant uh, resources has been uh, uh, responders, our local government fire agencies to the mutual aid system, um, our city councils, our city managers, our, our, our mayors, and our um, county executives that are supporting the system. Uh, without that support, we, we could not have the kind of resources uh, in support from the fire service that we, we, we uh, are getting. So this has truly been a one-team, one-fight approach across all of government. Um, we've also worked with our colleagues in other states. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, beyond the Utah uh, folks, we have Louisiana uh, and West Virginia National Guard. And uh, General Baldwin of the National Guard is here today. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But the National Guard has been a great supporter of this effort across uh, these various states. And even with the fire still burning, we also are moving into recovery where we can, trying to concurrently balance the response with the recovery. And we've all already initiated um, uh, hazardous materials teams to go in to remove household hazardous waste and other hazardous materials in the multiple counties where fires have occurred as the first stage of returning the damaged properties to their owners. This, this, this uh, will, will ultimately evolve into debris clearance operations um, as the fire, uh, fire uh, incident managers allow that to happen. Uh, and we also have doing damage assessments on the ground to document the extent of losses so that we can maximize our request for federal aid, which we're working on uh, on a uh, uh, request uh, to the president uh, for the governor to, to request to the president uh, a major disaster declaration. Um, if, if you've been evacuated, uh, it's important uh, to know, or if you've lost your home, it's also important to know that you um, follow your uh, local uh, county uh, updates for how to apply for aid. There are local assistance centers that are being established, uh, but you can also go on online uh, at their websites of your local county Office of Emergency Services, or you can come to Cal OES's, uh, this agency's uh, uh, website and, and get information on the wildfires. Uh, those local assistance centers, as they get uh, put up, are important because they will have a number of state and local and federal agencies and private sector that provide you information on how you can navigate through uh, what, what is truly a, a challenging time. Uh, Cal OES remains a, a quick partner with uh, all of our fire victims and, and survivors uh, and will be with you throughout uh, the days and months to come. In closing, uh, let me just say that um, I want all Californians to, to really think through being prepared uh, to be vigilant over the circumstances that we are facing. We are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination with regards to uh, the, the, these fire conditions. In fact, we're just beginning in the fire season and we're already in very, very critical conditions. Um, if you uh, uh, are told, if a fire starts in your area, you are told to evacuate, please do not wait, evacuate. That's what we want you to do. Um, it's critical. Uh, remember, material items can be replaced, but your life cannot. The other thing is, is that we've been working on uh, with sheriffs and law enforcement to do uh, preemptive uh, evacuations in some cases where we know the fire uh, is coming. And you say, may say, well, you know, the fire's right not next to me. And that's purposeful. One, it clears out the area and makes sure that the firefighters have access to your area but it also uh, makes sure that they don't have to be worrying about rescue instead of doing firefighting, and it does protect you. Uh, and I think that's a testament of why we have not actually had a lot of li uh, life loss in this particular fire siege, is that this is a new 
uh, uh, strategy, and we want to try to keep people out of harm's way. And so I can't thank enough our, our law enforcement mutual aid, the Highway Patrol, um, our sheriffs uh, who have been, uh, uh, you know, really steadfast in making sure this has all come together. And we'll know, learn a little bit about that further today from our partners at the uh, CHP. So, so um, each county has uh, alerts systems. You can sign up for getting alerts about evacuations and fire information. You certainly can go to CAL FIRE's website and get that, and you can come to CAL OES's website and be able to click on a link to be able to sign up for uh, alerts in your respective county. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my partner and, and uh, uh, our director of California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, CAL FIRE, uh, Chief Tom Porter. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gillarducci, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, this is a, a particularly difficult time, and uh, one where all of the mutual aid system is being stretched. Uh, the uh, response, the law enforcement, everything is uh, really stretched. And I can't thank you all enough, those who have, are supporting your communities that are sending uh, fire engines and, and uh, law enforcement officers uh, and overhead. Uh, we really need it, and it's, and it's making a difference uh, in this firefight that we're in, this siege that we're in. Uh, reflecting uh, just for a moment on last year, last year at this time, uh, we were deploying teams all over California to lightning fires uh, that had occurred and turned into complexes and ultimately became uh, the biggest uh, and most acres ever burned in California's uh, history that we are, have been tracking. Uh, this year, we're on track to do just the same. Uh, we are ahead of acres burned to date at this point. Uh, we continue to have initial attack fires uh, 34 just in the last 24 hours. Uh, none of those have become uh, large and damaging. Uh, so we're continuing to meet our, our uh, initial attack goals and, and needs within and around communities, uh, but also feeding the fires that need resources and making sure that we're keeping those fires as best we can uh, from continuing to uh, damage and destroy uh, uh, communities and uh, infrastructure along the way. So um, the biggest fire in states uh, his, or in, in the state right now is the Dixie Fire. Uh, Dixie Fire uh, is the first fire that we're aware of that has burned from the west side of the mountain range all the way over and to the valley floor on the east side of the mountain range. We don't have any record of that happening before. The fire uh, has been burning for uh, approximately 30 35 days. Uh, it is exceedingly uh, resistant to control. Uh, while we've had some successes and we've had some, some uh, lines that we've held and made good progress on, uh, when the winds come, we're finding that fires are spotting, uh, in some cases, miles outside of, of that fire because of the sheer magnitude of the material that's burning and the, and the heat that's being produced carrying large embers, chunks of wood, dropping them way out in front of, of the fire in, in receptive fuel beds. So this is not going to end anytime soon. We have to all be vigilant. We need to know when new fires are starting. Call 911. Make sure that you're reporting those fires. Make sure that you're, you're uh, being vigilant not to start fires by your own activities. But then, Lo and behold, while this is the second largest fire in California's history now, the Dixie, and the 14th uh, most damaging fire in, in California's history, now we have the Caldor Fire. Caldor Fire is in a very, very difficult spot. Uh, we've seen the King Fire burn uh, nearly in the same area. Uh, we have identified this uh, decades ago and continue to work through what is called the Fire Adapted 50 uh, program, which is a fuel reduction program, series of fuel breaks, shaded fuel breaks, fuel reduction project work, prescribed burns. All of that is being tested as we speak. That work is going to make a difference, 
but it also points to what we need to be doing more of in the future. And in the case of that I mentioned, when fire is jumping outside of its perimeter, sometimes miles, sometimes those fuel, fuel projects won't stop a fire. Sometimes they're just used to slow it enough to get people out of the way, which brings me to people out of the way. Getting people out of the way of these fires is the best way for us to be able to protect your communities. We need you to evacuate. We need you to evacuate early. Everybody is going to be sucking smoke for a long time. The fire is going to come and go the way the fire is going to come and go. These are fuels-driven fires as much as weather-driven fires, uh, and the drought conditions are allowing for that fuel condition to take fire wherever there's, there's uh, a receptive um, a path that it's going to go. So please, please heed the warnings, and then when you're asked to get out, get out, because we need you out of the way so we can protect your homes from these fires. It's the only way we can do it. If you're in our way in doing that, it, it might, might not only be your home that's lost, but it might be your neighbors as well. So um, further, big picture from the CAL FIRE resources side. We have uh, every CAL FIRE employee fully engaged in this siege, from Southern California all the way to the northern border. Uh, everybody is, is uh, supplying resources or supporting in some way. We have six uh, all-hazard type one incident management teams. Of the six that we have in the state, three of them are deployed as we speak. One of them is on hardcover. That leaves two additional uh, in the back pocket if we have a need for them. Right now, uh, we're hoping that won't be the case because as I said, everybody's already working. We'll have to move some, some things around. But we have those six teams uh, that are available uh, and they are proving very critical uh, again this year in, in helping bring calm to these uh, chaotic situations. The, not only are the resources stretched, but they're being used in a very strategic and surgical way. Um, the unfortunate thing is that these fires continue to get bigger, but we're surging resources into communities to protect and reduce the impact to communities as best we can and save as much as we can. And in some cases that has been uh, effective in keeping fire out of places like Chester. We surged resources, we herded the fire around Chester, 110,000 acres of timberland burned during one burning cycle on that fire. It did not burn Chester. But there's a side problem with all of this fire that's going on in the landscape. It is happening in California's timber basket. And I say that very specifically because California's timber basket is a huge part of California's climate initiative and carbon sequestration uh, goals in the future. We are seeing generational destruction of forests because of what these fires are doing. This is going to take a long time to come back from. And our timber industry partners are feeling a very, very big pinch during this. They're seeing their investment and their good work in sequestering carbon going away. So long-term effects, short-term, we need to surge resources, protect communities, yes. But we also have to put these fires out. In order to put these fires out, we need to keep from having more fires. So vigilance, vigilance, vigilance for every Californian. Also know every acre in California can and will burn someday. Just make sure that you're ready when it does. With that, uh, I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Tony Scardina, who is the Deputy Regional Forester for U.S. Forest Service Region 5 here in California. Tony. Good, mo uh, good morning. Thanks, Tom. First, uh, you know, let, let me start by just saying that uh, to Californians, we know you're going through a lot right now. Uh, communities have been impacted. 
a lot of smoke in the air and our hearts, our thoughts are with you. We are doing everything between federal, state, and local government to do everything we can to, su to suppress these fires. I'm going to give you a little bit of the national update uh, for the Forest Service and then bring that down to California. Right now, when you look in the West, there is extreme drought across most of the Western states, which is indicative of the type of fire behavior that we're seeing. Right now, there's over 100 large active fires across most of the Western states, and the Forest Service and the federal agencies are preparedness level five, which is the highest of our preparedness levels out of one through five, meaning that resources are stretched, there's large fire activity across most of the range, and there's drought conditions leading to extreme fire behavior. In Northern California, we are also at preparedness level five due to the amount of large fire activity. We have seven large fires across Northern California that we're currently managing, many that we're managing with local government as well as in concert with CAL FIRE. In Southern California, we're at preparedness level three. There's been some moisture conditions, but that will only last so long as we get into September and October. We expect to see drying out in the southern part of California and fire activity to pick up. Nationally, there are 10,000 federal firefighters deployed. 6,500 of those are in California. So 65% of the resources that we have federally are within the state of California, despite all of that activity across the other western states. Again, indicative of the type of fire behavior that we're experiencing. So what's our strategy? We continue to maintain our resources across the state so that we have effective initial attack capability. One thing that we want to do is to continue to suppress new fires so we don't add new fires to the landscape. Our success in that has been 98%. So we'll continue to stay aggressive. On the ground resources as well as aircraft are critical to that strategy. The other piece that we're doing is that we are going to do everything we can to fully suppress large fires and keep them as small as we can. As Tom mentioned, with the extreme fire behavior, that is difficult to do. We're going to continue to put as much aircraft and resources on the ground as we can, but keeping fire small at this point is quite difficult. And then we're going to prioritize our resources around protecting life, getting people out safely, protecting property, including the timberlands that Tom talked about, and then other resources after that. So that's how we prioritize our aircraft and our on-the-ground resources. The other thing that we're doing in the state right now is we have large closure areas around fires. The importance of that is to keep the public safe. We're also looking at the potential for broader closures across Northern California until the situation abates. We're able to get more resources into the state, and that is to keep the public safe, keep fires off the landscape, and keep our firefighters sustained over a long period of time. Our folks have been fighting fire for nearly two months now. They're tired. They're fatigued, they're digging lines 16 hours a day for 14 days straight, and we're doing everything we can for their health and safety as well. And again, I want to thank the communities out there that, we've, that have been impacted. They're going through a lot. We're all going to work together here to help them through that and get through that recovery process. With that, I'm going to hand it over to General Baldwin with CalGuard. Thank you. Thanks, Tony, and uh, good morning, everybody. The Cal Guard has uh, 970 soldiers, airmen, and sailors supporting uh, firefighting efforts throughout the state. That includes 122 military members from the states that D Director Ghilarducci mentioned, plus the state of Nevada and Wyoming's National Guard and the United States Air Force Reserve. We're flying 20 different types of aircraft in support of fire suppression operations. That includes firefighting helicopters, firefighting air tankers, medical evacuation helicopters, and manned and unmanned situational awareness aircraft that are assisting with fire mapping and damage assessment. We're also using our space-based systems to do initial fire detections to help CAL FIRE and U.S. Forest Service pounce on fires when they break out, and we can also use those systems for fire mapping and damage assessment. On the ground, we have 25 hand crews that are organized as both Type 1 and Type 2 hand crews that are supporting firefighting efforts, mainly on the Dixie Fire. We also have uh, 72 military policemen that are working in support of our partners in the Highway Patrol and the Plumas County Sheriff's Department, manning traffic control points to keep people out of harm's way up on the Dixie Fire. And then finally, we've just mobilized three very large uh, fuel tankers to provide logistic support to CAL FIRE up in Reading. And I'll be followed by uh, Chief Mike Dust from the California Highway Patrol.
Thank you, General. Uh, once again, I'm Mike Duss. I'm from CHP. I'm the Chief Over Valley Division. And uh, first and foremost, on behalf of Commissioner Ray, our hearts go out to all those affected by these fires, not only locally but statewide. And I also want to thank all the first responders who are also affected by these fires through evacuations and some of them losing their homes, and yet they still come to work to serve these communities. To that end, the California Highway Patrol statewide is providing assistance to local sheriffs, to fire services in, in support of traffic control points and evacuations. It's been said, it's been said earlier about um, the need to get out during warnings. There is a difference between a warning and an order. When warnings occur, traffic trickles out of, out of those communities. When an order happens, that turns into traffic jams, and it becomes very difficult then for people to escape. The CHP mans those traffic control points for the safety of the community. And one thing that we've noticed um, during all of these fires is once the fire is out of view, you might still see a CHP car sitting there. And the officer there gets asked questions. And we don't mind ask, answering any questions that you have. But some of those questions are, why can't I go? Why can't I go? There's no fire here. Why can't I go up to where my house is? And the reason is because there could be something around the corner that you don't know about. There's fire apparatus. There's hoses across roads. There's downed power lines and power poles. There's downed trees, contaminated water. There's all kinds of things that need to be mitigated and restored before we can open those roads. So we just ask for uh, your patience for our folks uh, during those. And um, thank you once again. And Director Giladucci, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Chief. All right. So um, as you can see, there's, um, you know, this state effort being coordinated uh, statewide here uh, at the State Operations Center, all these agencies, uh, local, state, and federal, uh, and private, uh, coming together in this uh, coordinated effort uh, to respond to these fires. Um, uh, and um, again, we're early in the season. Uh, I think we're going to have a very, very uh, challenging uh, summer months uh, that we, as it continues to be warm and dry, and we are in drought conditions. So um, uh, do we just ask for everyone's cooperation, patience, um, and uh, this isn't really just a government solution. This is, this is a, a whole of community solution. So every citizen in California is a partner with us in this, and your preparedness level and your actions uh, really do matter in this whole thing. So we, we thank you all for, for your cooperation with that. Uh, with that, this, myself, this team, will be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, question, I think it's on Florida or Tony. If I'm not mistaken, this morning, the total number of personnel on the Calvert Fire was 240-something, which seems awfully small for the size of that fire and the destruction that's, that's brought already. Uh, do you have any updated number of how, you, how many people are you going to be able to bring in anytime soon? Well, I'll, I will start. And yes, the, the 209 uh, showed 200 and... I think it was 47 or something like that. It was it was about 250 personnel. Um, that doesn't show what was coming in day shift this morning. So uh, I know for a fact uh, that uh, we we called up um, off of the Dixie fire uh, an additional six strike teams of engines. That's five engines each. Um, to out of Reno, they were they were R and R in Reno. They were coming onto the fire this morning. That's just one set of resources that were coming in from other areas as well. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if uh, Tony has any more specifics on that, but but it's that was the 209 from last night. But that last night and this morning, but it didn't reflect what would be there as of this morning. And the team just took. A, took over that fire at 0700 this morning, which was after last night's 209. Any other questions? I was going to ask how many acres, if you guys know, have burned so far with the Calvador fire? Um, guys have. I do have that. 
We have, uh, as of this morning, again, from the 209, it's 53,772 acres uh, and 47,272 of those acres just burned yesterday. So the total was 53,772. Just to add one thing to, to give an example of how stretched resources are. So uh, like CAL FIRE, they have six uh, incident command teams that help manage these large fires. The Forest Service in Region 5 has 10 incident command teams, and all of them are deployed. There's also federal incident command teams, and every federal incident command team in the country is on an active fire. With Caldor, we had no team available, and it shows the type of partnership that we have. Uh, Tom and his leadership and CAL FIRE was willing to help assist with that situation, um, and that's the type of work that we do together. When we're stretched for resources and we need to help each other out, that's what we do. I want to thank CAL FIRE and Tom for doing that and just kind of display the type of partnership that, that we're in to try and get these fires suppressed. Question for the Forest Service. I know you had mentioned earlier that um, the Forest Service is going to be considering broader evacuations in Northern California specifically in order to help keep more of us safe. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so right now we have uh, closure orders around the seven active fires that we have to keep the public out of areas where there's uh, firefighting activity and keep people safe. We are taking a look at the conditions that we have right now with extreme drought. Uh, extreme active fire behavior combined with the lack of resources. So if we have a new fire start and we're not able to put significant resources on it to fight it, we're thinking about can the public in that situation be safe? Is not having the public on federal lands for a period of time going to help us reduce new fire starts? And that's a hard decision to make. We did that last year for the first time in decades. I um, mean, it's not something that we take lightly. It's not something that we want to do. Uh, but with the conditions, we need as, as little a fire starts as possible on that landscape. And so we're having that conversation, thinking about is that the right move to make, and we're looking at probably around Labor Day weekend. Trying to get through Labor Day weekend, we believe that some of the conditions in other parts of the country are going to lighten up a little bit, which would hopefully bring more resources available and, be, uh, and a better firefighting scenario. So still in that conversation with our partners in the state, as well as local leaders to, to make that choice. Are you currently pulling resources from other fires to come up to the Caldor and Dixie fire? And how do you determine that if you are? Yes, uh, so what I'll say generally is that in California, we have uh, two operation centers, a Northern Operation Center and a Southern Operation Center that includes all of the partners, uh, federal, state, and local. The leadership, the fire leadership in those centers look at every fire in the state. They look at the con our, our priorities around protecting life and infrastructure and property, and they put resources on those fires based on those priorities. So they're trying to do everything they can to, one, look at, for example, the Dixie Fire, lots of communities at risk, lots of infrastructure, uh, private timberlands, things of that nature, and balance that with other fires that have also values at risk. So right now, as Tom mentioned, we may do a surge uh, where we bring resources from one fire to the other to try and, to try and damper, dampen that fire situation. Um, but that, that is part of the problem with that many fires on the landscape and values at risk. Having that balance and resources to meet our suppression strategies can be difficult. But that's how we prioritize across the state. Tom, you may want to add anything to that. Yeah, because I mentioned it, um, the, I know that the engines that uh, were coming out of Reno to the Cal, uh, Caldor Fire uh, this morning, they were assigned to the Dixie Fire up until last night. They were released from the Dixie Fire and sent straight over the hill because they were the closest resources available to get into the Calder Fire at the right time. So what we're doing is, uh, as uh, Tony mentioned, we are moving resources around as needed, uh, sharing among the, the incidents and sharing the right type of resources among the, the incidents. Sometimes type three engines, wildland engines are needed in one, on one fire and Type 1, more structure protection type engines are needed on the other fire. We can swap and move things around. Our, our uh, coordination centers at North Ops and South Ops are very adept at doing that and working with those incident management teams to make that happen. Both the federal and the state uh, incident management teams fall under that, that general coordination at those two locations, North Ops, South Ops. Resources stretched so far right now. Is there a plan to bring in more sources 
There is. Uh, we've been working uh, hard, and this is probably a, a, a team team approach. One team, one fight on this. Uh, we we put in resource orders from the the, the uh, fires themselves, so uh, those get filled as fills are available. That goes to all of the California mutual aid system, including Forest Service, the state, and all of our local government partners. Once we exhaust that, uh, we start to look at other, other places to go, out of state, out of state uh, through our EMAC uh, process, and that is uh, run through uh, Cal OES. Again, the orders originate at the fire, go to North Ops, South Ops, and then they get farmed into various places for additional resources. So we ask Cal OES to uh, bring in resources from out of state, reach out grab those resources that are available. Uh, we did that early on. Uh, we still are working through a, a, a list of 150 engines that have been requested in that system. Um, beyond that system and our, our mutual uh, aid across the nation that way, we also have looked into uh, what, what we can do to bring in resources from out of country. Uh, out of country resources, and I don't know, do you want to speak to this or do you want me to just uh, give it a cover and then I can. Okay. Yeah. I'll cover it from, from, from my perspective as a uh, state uh, kind of representative. Um, we're having a very difficult time. Uh, there are resources that are out there that are being shared internationally, but those resources are already committed. And so here's, here's the bigger situation. Not only do we have fires going on in the Western and, and throughout the United States, Canada is burning as well. And so they have large fires that they have uh, resources that they have moved from, let's say, Mexico. That takes the resources that we would normally get from Mexico out of play. It also takes Canada's resources out of play because they don't have resources to give. They're doing the same thing we're doing. Um, then there's the, the you know, overseas Pool. The overseas pool uh, is severely impacted by all that's going on uh, in the COVID environment. And so we are not getting resources that if we were not in pandemic days, uh, we were in normal kind of uh, pattern, if there is a normal anymore, uh, we would be able to pull those resources in that are in the southern hemisphere and bring them in uh, because they're not in fire season. However, that's not happening this year for the reasons I just mentioned. And do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, like Tom, I would just say, we always look at every tool possible. Um, when you look at other resources like International or, or uh, Department of Defense, that's where Tom's mentioning one, remember we're in a pandemic environment. So when we're thinking about bringing resources from other places, other countries, we've got to think about that. With the Delta variant, we have seen a pickup and spread in the crews. We've gone back to additional mitigations to protect them, and that is working very well, but we need to be very vigilant about that. The other thing, too, is it takes food, it takes boots, it takes equipment to, to house more people. And when you look at the situation uh, nationally and in the state right now, evacuations, well, those people need hotels, and we got to be careful not to take that space. Uh, when it comes to supply chains for food and other things, there's some complexities around that. So as we look at those options, and they may be obvious, there's some logistical factors as well as the COVID environment that we're factoring in before we make that decision. Uh, Chief Porter, um, follow-up. When you talk about bringing a resource of those 30 engines or so from Reno, first of all, clarification, are those Nevada resources or they just happen to be parked in Reno? Uh, for clarification, they just happen to be parked in, in Reno. They were California resources. Okay, and there's no easy answer to this one, but is now the time to be pulling resources away from the Dixie Fire? It, and that's a great question and one that, that um, I'm going to reflect back to the beginning of this uh, press conference. We are surging resources to where the greatest need is at the time of that need. and. While the Dixie is going to continue to have uh, difficult times, it has more resources than any other fire in the state. Therefore, by shifting resources around uh, and making sure that we have all of the uh, branches and divisions of the Dixie fire staffed and then using other resources and bringing them down to the uh, Caldor, 
that's the way we're doing this. So it's, it's a surge kind of to where the greatest need is. And there are some times when uh, we need to put resources where the impacts to lives and property are greatest. And so we're taking, we're taking resources away from a fire that has less of that potential at the moment than the Caldor does at the moment. And I wanted to add one thing from my, the previous question, uh, and that is uh, I neglected and, and, uh, and not because I don't think of them daily, but our, uh, our National Guard partners are huge in, in surging as well. And early on, again, through the, um, the mutual aid system and, and working with uh, Cal OES, we called up uh, our, our ability to put uh, what we call type two hand crews in place. They, they are hugely helpful in making sure we have the boots on the ground to hold fire line and then take the Forest Service hotshot or the, the uh, interagency hotshot uh, crews and our other fire type one fire crews and put them on the hot areas of fire. So it's a huge partnership and, and one that we exercised early this, uh, this uh, summer. I just want to just add a little more and more thing to that. Um, resource management in a state of, of, of our size and complexity is, is always a, a very, um, you know, ongoing strategic uh, effort. Um, we have to make sure that we don't, we, we balance our resources off across the state. We have to consider what we don't know is going to happen tomorrow. We could have an earthquake. We could have some other uh, major event. Uh, plus, we have to make sure our local governments have the, all the resources they need to protect their communities at large. So we always have we always have a buffer uh, every, as we manage resources. And and um, to Tom's point, uh, we may divert for life saving and property protection on a fire that is critical. We we don't we want to keep these fires as small as possible and get those resources on them. And then it becomes a balance across uh, across the state. We've talked a lot about how we're stretched. We are stretched. But we also are, are continuing to work uh, through the system and making sure we've got a little reserve to be able to address these new fires as they, as they break. Question for you. Um, so how fast do these alerts go out to these communities? Um, like how, how fast can they get the warning ahead of time um, when the fires start approaching? So, the, so really the, the, the incident managers that are responding and setting up Doing the assessment of what what parts of the community need to be evacuated and 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 how many, that gets that's coordinated with the local law enforcement, um, and then they push that that messaging out through a variety of sources. One could be uh, through a a county run um, uh, alert and warning network, something like a a Nixol or a, a Code Red, and and different di there are different companies that have that. We ask you to go and sign up and go to your county uh, office of emergency services. Sign up for those um, those alerts. The other way is through the wireless emergency alert system. That's a national system that we can push out information that gets pushed out by the local government or can be pushed out here at, at state OES um, and um, uh, local law enforcement, CHP, uh, sheriff, police. They will go door to door and, and go through the community. Uh, public address systems. They may have high low sirens that are notifying the community, be knocking on your door uh, to get people out. It happens relatively fast. Once they get the notice that, that an area identified, they'll also put up maps so that people can see what's going on. And then we want people uh, to move out as, as rapidly as they possibly can. And a uh, second question. Um, the Dipti fire is now the second largest fire. I think a couple of weeks ago, maybe uh, somebody said it was the single largest. Fire. So, single, single yeah, let, let me uh, clarify. Um, we, on the official list that CAL FIRE uh, maintains, we count fires that are complexes and single start fires on the same list. So splitting hairs, the Dixie is the single start largest fire of any other in the state's history. However, the August complex is still the largest fire, and it's quite a bit larger. Uh, it's uh, 1.2 million acres. Uh, we're about half that size, a little over half that size uh, with the Dixie as a single start. And, and the fly fire is in there as well. 
So if you, even if you take those acres out, it's still the single largest for single start. Can you elaborate on the mix of the are being done to protect our firefighters as the Delta variant is spreading. As you, you had mentioned, someone had mentioned that you had seen an increase in cases or yeah, positive yeah, cases. Yeah, I, I think actually you go first and I'll go, I'll go second on that one. Yeah, I mean, the, the mitigations we follow are, are clearly in line with, with CDC as a starting point. So. Um, back to masking uh, all of our all of our folks in incidents as uh, well as on the crews are masking whenever they can obviously firefighters that are on the line fighting fire um, cannot wear a mask at all times because of the conditions that they're in uh, we're also looking at some testing protocols of how we can test our firefighters so that before they end up on the fire line uh, and and we can catch it early um, and also then separate those crews we also have mitigations in place. When you look at the past, we used to have large fires where camps of thousands of firefighters and others would be together and they would eat together and be in the same space together. So what we do now is we try and spread those camps out, keep people small, and also not have the crews interact with one another so that if one crew does have a, a situation where there is a positive case, then it limits the spread to other crews and doesn't carry as a community effect. Um, we've also been proactive on our incidents of having uh, Local health departments work with us, uh, putting vaccination clinics within the fire camps. Oftentimes, the firefighters, they work a 14-day assignment, then they have three days off. At the end of the assignment, before they go home, then they, they have the option of that choice with the clinic being there, and that's been really beneficial with a lot of our local health clinics. Like I said, we had a little bit of an uptick early on in the season, uh, what I would consider to be an insignificant impact to our capability, and we've done a good job in the past few weeks of leveling that out with a couple additional measures. Yeah, and much the same uh, with the CAL FIRE side. Uh, we've actually seen a much lower rate in camp uh, settings this year than we did last year. Vaccinations are helping with that uh, considerably. Masking in congregate spaces uh, is helping as well. And, and then another piece is we've have, we have firefighters that have been out for a very long time. They've only been with their firefighting group. And so they're not getting a lot of external exposure either. Anything else, sir? Uh, yes, a question for Tony. Um, and you kind of alluded to this uh, a few minutes ago, but the Calder fire for the first uh, 24, 36 hours kind of behaved itself, uh, and then it blew up on Monday night. Could, could it have been down and, and brought totally under control? Yeah, I, I think uh, between the uh, federal, state, and local resources, as we always do, we did everything we could to have aggressive initial attack, nothing different. One of the limiting factors when it came to that fire is there was quite a significant smoke over top of that fire, limiting aircraft capability. And that's, that's the way on several fires, once we have situations where smoke settles in that air, um, airspace and visibility become limited and the ability to use that tool on initial attack becomes limited. So aircraft is a really good tool on initial attack because it helps slow the fire down so that our hand crews can then get on the ground and catch up to it and then get line around it. And there were se several limiting factors on the cow door, tough terrain, uh, difficult spot, limited aircraft capability, uh, but we still uh, had the same type of initial attack res response we would have with our partners as we would on any incident that we're trying to suppress at this point. On if you guys will be calling in the super tanker from Colorado. I think you're talking about the Are you talking about the 747? Yeah. So that 747 is is no longer in the inventory. The the owners of that uh, have moved transferred it over to a cargo aircraft. But but the the large air tankers that are available um, that uh, are really private are, are either uh, under contract by the Forest Service or. Uh, call when needed contract here in, in, uh, in uh, at Cal Fire. Um, and, you know, we're using all the, the various um, uh, heavy lift aircraft that we can, including the National Guard, uh, what they call MAFs, which we have a number of them here in California uh, from throughout the country. Thank all right. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.
Okay, good morning. This is uh, Pat Mellon. Can anybody hear me? You're good now. Yeah. Sure can. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so welcome to the uh, the November meeting of the 911 Advisory Board meeting. We'll start off with a roll call. Uh, Chief uh, Chris Child from CHP. Present. Uh, Brenda Brunner. Present. Liam Magoski. Present. Rosa Ramos. Sheriff Braun. Here. Sheriff Ayub. Sheriff William Ayub. <coughs> uh, Chief Edward Hadfield. Chris Heron. Present. Chief Elise Warren. Here. Chief Andrew White. Here. Okay, we have uh, we have a quorum with seven members present. Uh, going to the item number two is the approval of the August 20th or August 2020 meeting. It was held via video conference. Uh, is there a motion to, are there any corrections? Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Who, that, who is that? Brenda Bruner. Chris Heron, I'll second. Okay. Then we'll go to a roll call vote. Um, Chief Childs. Well, I would approve them, but I wasn't on the last meeting, so my apologies. Okay. This is my okay. first meeting. Okay. Uh, Brenda Bruner. Aye. Okay. Uh, Leanne Magoski? Aye. Uh, Sheriff Braun? Aye. Uh, Chief, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chris Heron? Aye. Uh, Chief Warren? Aye. And Chief White? Aye. Okay, the minutes are approved. Okay, so now we go into closed session. Um, it is uh, pursuant to uh, government code section uh, 11126E. So we'll temporarily um, step away from this and go, go into closed session. Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, closed session has completed. All of our board members will be logging back into the Zoom meeting. Uh, we'll give them a few minutes and then uh, Pat Mallon will uh, go through another roll call to establish quorum again and then we'll proceed forward with the board meeting. And Pat, when you open up session, would you just please remind everyone that we are recording uh, session uh, in the open forum? Sure will. Thank you, sir. All right, let's, uh, we'll go through the uh, roll call of the board members again. Uh, you know, for all the members, please, please know that we are recording this, um, uh, this session, and I believe it's YouTube. It's gonna be posted. There will be a YouTube video of it, so uh, just be aware of that. Uh, Chief uh, Chris Child, CHP. I'm here, present. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brenner Brunner. Present. Leanne Magoski. Present. Rosa Ramos. Was missing before. Sheriff Braun. Here. Uh, Sheriff Ayub, I noticed that you are, were on the closed session. I'm here. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chief Hadfield. Uh, Chris Heron. Present. Chief, Chief Warren. Here. And Chief White. Present. Okay, thank you all. Uh, as far as the uh, closed session, uh, we provided a, an, an outage report to the, to the board members. And other than that, there's nothing to report. Moving on to the legislative update. Uh, Mr. Salvador is the chief of our legislative and external affairs, Reggie. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? We can, sir. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and read through a couple of the uh, state bills related to 911 that uh, had been signed during this last session. 
Um, as a reminder, you will be receiving a list of both these bills as well as a list of federal bills that we are tracking, noting that I will just be discussing the state bills as uh, Congress are currently in a lame duck session right now, uh, given all the activities in uh, Washington. So to start off with, AB 1775 has been signed by the governor on September 30th, which uh, is by Assembly Member Reggie John Sawyer and deals with false reports of harassment. This hey, provides, Reggie. Yep. Reggie, your, your audio is coming in and out, so I'm not sure how close to the microphone you are, but it's very difficult to hear you, which is uncharacteristic, by the way. Is this better? Can you hear me better? Folks, can you hear me better? Yeah, I sure can. Thank yeah. you, Reggie. So AB 1775 was signed and that provides that intimidation by threat of violence includes knowingly or recklessly making or threatening to make a false claim or report to a police officer or law enforcement agency alleging that another- Hey, Reg, I, I'm not hearing you very well right now. I don't know if the rest of the board members can hear you. Um, you're just coming in very, very lightly. Fading in and out with a little feedback in the background. Oh boy, here, let me, let me do this. I think it's whenever you turn to look at something else, it like cuts it out. Or maybe wherever your notes are. How about this? That's perfect, but as soon as you look wherever you're looking, that's when it cuts out. Okay, well then here we go. So bottom line, AB 75 was, AB 1775 was signed, right? And uh, it's basically, uh, also states that knowingly allowing the use of or using the 911 emergency system for the purpose of harassing another is a crime that is punishable. So that was signed on September 30th. Also signed was AB 1945 by Assemblymember Salas, and that actually defines a first responder for first for the purposes of the California Emergency Services Act as an employee of the state or a local public agency who provides emergency response services, including a police officer, firefighter, paramedic, emergency medical technician, public safety dispatcher, or a public safety telecommunicator. It also provides that the definition of first responder does not confer a right to an employee to obtain a retirement benefit formula for the employment classification that is not included or is expressly excluded that formula. Also signed was AB 2213 by Assemblymember Lamone, which, would, which requires Cal OES and California volunteers in coordination with the VOADs or vo voluntary organizations active in disaster to develop planning guidance to identify volunteers and donation management resources that could assist in responding to or recovering from disasters. What is specifically notable about this is that at the very last minute, the legislature took provisions that were initially in SB 794 by Assembly Member Hannah Beth Jackson and inserted it into this bill. And what that clause does is that it authorizes a city to enter into an agreement to access the contact information of resident account holders through the records of a public utility and expands the types of public utilities that can enter into these agreements. Now, what that actually does is it also expands the ability for alert and warning uh, notifications that is, was originally set on the county, but now has expanded to the cities as well. Lastly, SB 1441 was also signed by Senator McGuire, which extends the operation of the local prepaid mobile telephony services collection act indefinitely, and it makes non-substantive changes to eliminate cross-references in the MTS Act to the Prepaid Mobile Telephony Services Surcharge Collection Act. Other than that, I will be sure to provide this to, uh, to the board members and uh, will be sent out accordingly. And I'll be able to uh, uh, answer any questions you may have, if you guys can hear me again. I see. Um, Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. All right. Next item up is agenda item number five, which is a 911 branch report, and we'll turn it over to Budge. All right. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate that. Um, 
zoom the camera over here to where I am. If I can figure all this technology out. All right, um, so I'm gonna be giving you an update um, on the items that you see on this graphic here. Um, and I, I'm going to apologize in advance because the 911, the next gen 911 update is going to be rather lengthy. So you may wanna make sure you've got a full cup of coffee um, because it's, it might take us a moment to get through that. Uh, so we'll start with the call stats. Next slide. Clicker's not working. Um, these have remained unchanged, but what we did was we wanted to take a look at changes that may have been happening in our call stats um, due to COVID and, and wildfires. So we ran some stats comparing July of 2019 to July of 2020. Uh, and then August and September. And you see that our 2020 volumes are a little lower than what they were from 2019. So certainly not the significant dip that we had seen earlier in the year when it, we were on lockdown, but definitely the, the 911 call volume is slightly down. I don't know what that percentage is, but it's not a significant difference. So um, we will have our finalized numbers for the entire year in a couple of months, uh, but we wanted to give you kind of this snapshot of where we are at this point in time. All right, we also have had a slowdown in our statewide CPE installation, and primarily that's due to two things, uh, COVID, number one, and some challenges that we were having with our CPE and its ability to support NextGen 911 I3 standards. So in our contract, we have the requirement that our CPE is NINA I3 capable. And we've been testing that in the lab and we've, we've got an updated status for you there. So we built a lab, it's got Motorola Vesta equipment in it and it's got Intrato Viper equipment in it. And we're testing to ensure that the CPE equipment we've already purchased and installed at the PSAPs is NINA I3 compliant. And what we're learning is that both companies, um, both solutions needed software upgrades in order to make the interface. We have finalized the software version for Entrato. So those are the Viper systems and we'll be able to get those software upgrades out to the PSAPs. The Vesta equipment, we, we have finished our testing but Motorola is in the final stages of validating that software. They will not have that software ready for Cal OES until the end of November. And then at that point, we will be able to schedule those upgrades as well. So what we've done in the interim is we have suspended uh, sale on that equipment because we can't knowingly sell CPE equipment that's not compliant with the contract. Once we solve those contractual things, we'll take another look at, um, at where we are with CPE upgrades. And obviously we're gonna work very closely with our plan for the cloud and um, data center model CPE that are on the new contract. So the next step in this process for this graphic here, Andrew Matson will be um, coordinating, um, will be coordinating with your PSAP to make sure that uh, we coordinate the install and upgrade of the software, all right? So can you mute us for just a second? Just a second. Um, so that's kind of where we are with CPE. I'm gonna pause there to see if there's any, any questions on this slide or, or where we are with CPE, because I know this is extremely important to the PSAPs out there. Yes, Brenda Bruner. Um, I have a question. The software that's going to be tested in the lab, is this the cloud-based CPE software or is this different? So great question, Brenda. It, it's really both. Um, what this slide is talking about here, though, is testing the exact equipment that most PSAPs have in their back rooms today. So the Viper and Vesta systems that are out there today, that's what this graphic is about. I'll talk about the new cloud-based um, in about, I don't know, 10 slides or so. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions on this slide? Okay, um, I think you need to 
Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this is just an update of where we are with text to 911 deployment. Uh, it's mandatory that we finish this by January 1st, 2020. We have good news in that we are actively working with every PSAP in the state to complete that install. And we are at about 80% uh, complete with this project. And depending on the test schedule with the um, originating service providers and the text control centers, we are on track to finish this by January 1st. Sharice has been working remarkably hard on this project. And so if you have any questions or concerns, certainly reach out to her. What you see on this graphic is the breakdown of how many PSAPs will get over the top, roughly 200, I mean uh, 300, and how many will be uh, integrated, which is, I don't know, what's that math? 137. So that's a breakdown of those that have integrated text versus those that are using the ComTech over the top solution. We do want to point out that those PSAPs that are using the over the top solution after next gen 911 is deployed, we will be transitioning them from ComTech over to rapid deploy. And we could talk about that. Uh, I've got a couple graphics on that later. Any questions on text? All right. So now we're going to walk through where we are with next gen 911. So we've developed this graphic to give you an update on PSAP installs, our OSP, originating service provider integration, the test and integration that we're doing. We have a lot of detail on that today to give you an understanding of where we are. And then the transition plan, which we briefed out last time, and we'll give you a, a refresh on that. So this is an update on our system providers. Um, I think all of you are very familiar with this graphic. The one thing we will let you know on this is that we're predicting uh, the completion will be more toward July of 